Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of October 28th, 2021. So my name is Maartje Boon, and I'm a colleague of Hadi at TU Delft, who unfortunately could not make it today. But together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watt, I have the pleasure to co-host today's webinar. So we are delighted to host Delphine Rubinet of Geosciences Montpellier as our distinguished speaker. Delphine Rubinet is a CNRS researcher at Geosciences Montpellier in France since 2017. She obtained a PhD in Earth Sciences at the University of Rennes in 2011 and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, San Diego from 2011 to 2013 and the University of Lausanne from 2013 to 2016. She has a background in mathematics and modeling that she applies to various problems in the geosciences. She is specialized in fractured rocks and heterogeneous domains for which she develops analytical, numerical and hybrid approaches to simulating flow and transport processes. Her objectives range from characterizing heterogeneous systems with hydraulic, thermal, chemical and geophysical experiments to predicting the fate of flow, heat and contaminant from laboratory to field scale. She works in the team Transfer in Porous Media in the Department of uh, Hydro Systems at Geosciences Montpellier. And this team develops laboratory and field experimental equipments, as well as numerical tools for characterizing and modeling at several scales, coupled flow and transport processes with geochemical reactions in heterogeneous and fractured aquifers and reservoirs. Um, this is applied in the context of dispersion and rem remediation of pollutants in natural and artificial systems, as well as thermo hydrochemical coupling for geological storage and geothermal and hydrothermal systems. So thank you, Delphine, for uh, graciously accepting our invitation. So to the audience, please note that this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions. And please type your questions in the chat box and Sebastian will take them after the lecture. So please do not wait till the end of the lecture to post your questions but just type them whenever you feel appropriate as they may trigger questions by other participants. So Delphine, thank you very much for being here and we're all very much looking forward to hearing your lecture so please start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here online and uh, thanks for the invitation to the organizers. Um, so today we'll talk about electrical measurements um, applied to fracture rocks and uh, we'll see what we can learn from this uh, measurement from laboratory to field scale. So I'll start with this slide to show you the different applications um, that we will see during the talk. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I'll take the opportunity to uh, mention the co-workers who work with me on uh, these projects. Uh, so we'll start with the lab scale uh, on the left side, where uh, here uh, we work, for example, on uh, rock samples that we extract usually from borehole. And uh, we want, uh, with this device, to measure the electrical conductivity of these samples and uh, from this to uh, characterize these samples. And for this, uh, these rock samples are uh, saturated with uh, water that is um, that has also uh, given electrical conductivity and uh, in this case we are going to relate the electrical conductivity of the fluid and of the sample and uh, from this uh, we get different parameters such as the formation factor or cementation uh, index uh, with a, a very well known uh, Archie's law and um, while the overall objective is uh, to be able to uh, evaluate uh, the porosity, for example, of uh, the rock while we do then measurement in boreholes. So we'll talk about uh, this kind of uh, parameters. And uh, then if we go at the field scale, uh, we'll talk also about electrical resistivity experiment, ERT experiments. Uh, where here you have uh, my co-worker Cédric Champollion um, and I forgot to mention the lab uh, work is uh, with a co-worker uh, Philippe Desar. So here we have Cédric Champollion with a student who is in the field and uh, you can see this uh, long cable on the road and along this cable you have many electrodes like hundreds of electrodes and we measure um, electrical potential between uh, these electrodes. 
So we work um, for each measurement with four electrodes and uh, we can work with different configurations of these electrodes. So we have here example for the Wiener Schoenberg configuration and uh, here you have the dipole dipole. And every time we will have two uh, current electrodes and two measurement electrodes. In this case, the current electrode are A, B, so we inject in A and we extract the electric current in B. And we measure the difference in electrical potential between M and M. And M. And for the dipole-dipole, we have the current electrode on one side and the measurement electrode on the other side. And from this, we get um, uh, many uh, data because we do that all along the cable. So we end up with hundreds of, uh, of this uh, difference uh, in electrical potential. And from these measurements, we hope to characterize uh, the subsurface. Um, and then uh, we'll see another application, which is about uh, spontaneous potential, where here we will uh, measure the electrical potential to uh, measure the excess of charge that is related in no case to uh, fluid flow in the system. So excess of charge can be related to many processes, but here we will assume that uh, this will help us to characterize free flow. And this work is uh, uh, in collaboration with Damien Junio from uh, METIS and uh, James Irving and Niklas Linde uh, from UNIL. So for all these applications, uh, we need uh, some forward models that will be uh, well suited for fracture works. So it means that we want models that will be able to consider the uh, structures um, structures that are very thin and conductive, like fractures, right? Uh, very thin and uh, that are uh, in a, a much larger um, domains. Uh, and we want also uh, some uh, very efficient uh, forward models because at the very end, what we want to do is to use these forward models in some inversion strategies. So that would be our objective here. So here we have a very simplified overview of existing uh, modeling approach for uh, electric current flow. Uh, first, we have uh, this kind of study where um, they work with analytical solutions, which are very easy to use and, and uh, with no computational cost, right? Uh, but in this case, it won't be adapted to uh, fracture works because we cannot have thin elements uh, such as fractures. So then we can uh, also discretize everything uh, that's, like it's done here, where we use uh, very fine meshes for uh, the two boreholes that the authors consider and the fractures that intersect these boreholes. But in this case, uh, we'll have uh, some computational issues because this is going to be very heavy in terms of computational cost and that will be hard to use uh, for inversion. And then we can reduce this cost by uh, ignoring the matrix, for example, like it's done here. So uh, in these studies, they discretize only the uh, fracture network, uh, which is already a big, very big work in 3D. Um, but here the problem is that for electric current flow, we will need to take into account the matrix. So we can neglect the matrix when we work with fluid flow and, for example, in granite systems because we we'll say that the uh, permeability of the matrix part is very small in comparison to the fracture part. But when we talk about electric current flow, we never have a contrast between the two structures that is high enough uh, such that we can ignore the, the matrix. So we need the matrix part. Um, okay, so from this, um, then we can um, say that the electric current flow problem is very similar to the feed flow problem. Uh, here we have two uh, simple uh, Poisson equation, and uh, we have uh, here's the relationship between current density and electrical conductivity and electric potential, which is similar to this expression of the Darcy uh, velocity, right? And then if we work on fractures and we want to consider fractures as discrete elements will have, for example, this uh, 3D object that is a fracture represented by uh, two plates um, that we will represent as a plan. 
for which the uh, properties will be average over the aperture, uh, that will be our discrete element. So from 3D, we work with a 2D element. And for the hydraulic problem, we'll talk about hydraulic transmissivity. For the electrical problem, we we'll talk about electrical conductance for this fracture. So when we see that these two problems are very similar, we think that maybe we could use some of the uh, numerical method that are developed uh, for free flow uh, and use them for uh, electric uh, current flow, right? So again, that's a very simple overview of the uh, methods for free flow. Uh, as before, we can discretize everything, but here um, we'll have uh, computational issues in our case. Uh, we can also consider the dual porosity formulation, where in this case, we consider the matrix problem on one side, the fractures problem on the other side, and we couple uh, these two problems. Uh, here, they use uh, an equivalent representation of the fracture system, but we can also uh, fully represent the fractures and the complexity and organization, like in this case. For this example, they work with a simple permeability concept, um, which means that the uh, matrix will be uh, seen as a storage area. So the free flow can go uh, from the fracture to the matrix, from the matrix to the fracture, but there is no exchange of flow uh, between the matrix areas, uh, which won't be good uh, for the electric current flow. So then we can look at the dual permeability formulation, where in this case, we have free flow in the fractures, free flow in the matrix, and exchange between the two uh, structures. So that's what we did, and we, we uh, thought it would be a good idea to adapt uh, this uh, method to uh, the electric current flow uh, problem. Uh, and that's what I'm going to present here, so um, I try to go quickly on this part. Um, so we develop what we call the uh, discrete dual porosity approach that we call DDP, where um, here we work in 2D for, uh, for now. And we have, again, this Poisson equation that we saw before. And as we work in 2D, uh, the fractures will be represented by 1D element so that the uh, black uh, segment that we see here, and the matrix uh, is uh, represented by these coarse uh, blocks uh, that we see in the back. And here we have this expression for the exchanges between the matrix and the fracture part. So again, we want something uh, that is efficient, where we can represent the fractures, cause discretization of the matrix, and we want to be able to handle complex fracture networks. And for that, we work first at the fracture scale, where we develop an analytical solution for the expression of the electrical potential along the fracture. And then we use this analytical solution at the fracture network scale uh, to enforce uh, flow conservation at the intersection of the fractures. And uh, then we work with the matrix parts with a modified finite volume approach where we take into account the exchange between the fracture and the matrix. So that are the expression of the analytical solution and uh, of the finite volume approach. And um, we end up when we do all this thing with a, a standard linear system. Uh, and when we solve this, we obtain the distribution of the electrical potential in the matrix blocks and at the fractures uh, extremities and uh, intersections. Uh, so now that we have this uh, model, we're going to use it uh, first for uh, the study at the lab scale, where uh, we want to uh, evaluate these electrical uh, parameters. And we work again uh, on these equations. And uh, when we solve these equations, we're going to evaluate the equivalent um, electrical conductivity of uh, this kind uh, of system. Uh, and from this equivalent conductivity, we will evaluate the formation factor, Archie exponent, and electrical tortuosity. And the idea here is to, to reproduce with numerical experiments what we will observe in the lab and to 
explain the different values of these parameters that we have in the lab. So here we work with unit size systems just to simplify everything, but um, this could be smaller. And we are going to look at different uh, distribution for the fracture lens, uh, uniform distribution and power law uh, distribution. So here we work with uniform and, and these networks are power law uh, distributed for the lens. And we look at different uh, density, density of the fracture network. And uh, we are showing here um, the changes uh, in the formation factor with the porosity. And for each uh, set of parameters or properties of the fracture network, we will run uh, five random um, uh, realization of the fracture network. So that's why every time we have five symbols, uh, symbols for each um, property. So here we look at the results uh, from our, our systems and uh, we look also at the results if we consider only the fractures and if we consider only the metrics. And then if we consider some simplified system, uh, which are equivalent systems with uh, parallel uh, fractures. So what we see first is that when we have a very high density of fractures, like this case, uh, the behavior is the same as when we consider only the fractures, because in this case, the metrics uh, won't be important, so important because we have something to dance. And then when we reduce the density of the system, this, the matrix is getting more and more important. And we see also that we can easily um, reproduce these results with simplified representation when we have something dense enough. But then when we are uh, with small density like this ones, where here we have the per collision threshold, huh? uh, we cannot reproduce all this with simplified system because here we are uh, far from uh, the REV of the system. Um, and then for the power law uh, distributed lens, we see that it's more difficult to find simplified uh, representation of the system. Uh, here we see as, as well that we can easily uh, fit the Archie's law where we have something dense enough and uh, we uh, obtain the uh, corresponding Archie exponent. And we cannot fit this law uh, with a, a system at the per collision threshold again because uh, we are far uh, from the REV in this case. So we do the same for the Archie exponent and the electrical tortuosity, and we get uh, by this way um, the range of variation of these uh, parameters. And then um, we, we see here that we have a, a high variability of the results, uh, again, for the same uh, property of the network. Huh? So here we wanted to, to use the fact that we have an efficient model to run more simulations and to characterize uh, this variability. So that's why we did here, and um, I won't go uh, too much into the details, but here we run 100 uh, realizations for each um, fraction network property. And uh, we can see uh, that we have a very large um, ranges of variation of the electrical uh, properties. So in this case, that would be very hard to relate uh, these properties uh, measure in the lab to some uh, fracture network uh, configurations or properties. Um, and here we attempt to uh, find a law for the average values of these simulations. And um, here, when we add more parameter with this critical porosity, we, we kind of get something for the uniform um, lens. Uh, and uh, we see that it's harder for the power law uh, distributed uh, lens. Okay, so this is the lab scale. Uh, now, if we go to the feed scale, uh, we're going to work now with this kind of fracture networks where we have here uh, something uh, dense enough, so we are uh, at the REV scale. Uh, and uh, we look at um, different properties. So here we have some uh, constant aperture then we are going to look at a network with uh, aperture that is log normally distributed with different log normal distribution and with the lens uh, again uh, power law distributed. We'll have different angles and uh, some networks that are 
uh, connected uh, in terms of aperture and length, and uh, the other are not um, correlated. Um, and here, what we want to do is to compare the hydraulic and electrical properties of the system, because uh, very often in the field, we'll have some electrical measurements. And from these measurement, measurements um, are inferred uh, um, hydraulic uh, properties. So for that, uh, we uh, consider, uh, like we saw before, the hydraulic transmissivity for the fractures and the electrical conductance, um, sorry, for the fractures for the hydraulic problem and the electrical conductance for the uh, electrical properties. And uh, we solve our problem on the network that we saw before and evaluate the fluid or electric current flow in the system. And from that, we obtain the hydraulic or electrical um, uh, conductivity uh, as a tensor for each of these systems. And we compare uh, the results that we have in terms of REV size and uh, anisotropy ratio for the hydraulic properties here in red and for the electrical properties that are in blue. And then we look at how we should change uh, the contrast uh, in the uh, fracture and matrix electrical properties to obtain the same uh, behavior as the hydraulic properties. Um, so uh, again, and won't go too much into the details for that, but basically what we see is that the REV size for the hydraulic property is always higher than the one for the electrical properties. So we cannot infer uh, REV size uh, in terms of electrical properties from uh, hydraulic properties. And uh, we see also that um, this REV size um, change, um, change for hydraulic property with the aperture of uh, one set, for, for example, like we see here, uh, and also with the power law exponent uh, of, the, oops, of the fracture lens. Uh, while it's not the case uh, for the electrical property, which is uh, pretty much not impacted by all this changes in uh, parameter. And uh, we have um, some similar observation for the anisotropy. Uh, well, it will be changing for some parameters for the hydraulic properties and not really for the electrical uh, properties. Um, okay, so now uh, we go to another application still for 2D models, but we'll talk about spontaneous potential where in this case, we need to solve two problems. The first problem is a hydrogeological problem where we have uh, what we saw before uh, for um, the equation of this problem. And here we we'll use a DDP model that we saw before for electric current. We use it for free flow. So it means that in this case, the exchange between the fracture and matrix uh, will be expressed with the permeability of the matrix and the difference in the hydraulic head between uh, matrix and fracture. So that's the first problem. And the second problem will be the uh, electrical problem that we saw before, except that we have an additional term here, which represents the excess of charge due to the presence of fluid flow in the system. Here again, we use a DDP model, but we have in this case, um, uh, two uh, terms for the exchange between fracture and matrix. The first one is a standard electric, uh, electric current exchange. And the second one uh, corresponds to the exchange due uh, to the excess of charge related to uh, free flow. Uh, and we couple these uh, two, uh, two problems. So once we do that, uh, we can uh, look at uh, these kinds of results where here we are looking at the top view of the system and we are pumping at the center of the system uh, where two fractures intersect uh, the pumping. And we see that one fracture uh, reach, uh, reaches the domain uh, boundaries, uh, which are a fixed uh, hydraulic head. Um, so the, the fluid flow is uh, coming from this boundary for this fracture. And the second fracture is smallest. So in this case, uh, 
uh, when we are uh, pumping in the well, uh, this fracture will contribute to the pumping uh, by uh, taking water uh, or fluid from the uh, matrix part, right? So for this, um, we solve our problem and we look at the distribution of the electrical potential. Uh, in the first case here, when we consider that the free flow in the matrix is negligible, and here we take into account the free flow in the matrix. So we wanted to test that because uh, in our case, you can see that the permeability in the matrix is very small, huh? it's 10 to minus 15. So we, if we were working only in terms of free flow, we could probably neglect the matrix part. But we see here that when we work in terms of uh, electrical potential, we have to take into account uh, this uh, matrix part for the free flow. Okay, and then, uh, so here we have this um, nice distribution uh, of the electrical potential, but then in the field, we will uh, more have uh, like measurements like around these uh, black circles and we will uh, observe something uh, like this uh, below. And uh, we see in this measurement that we have uh, two uh, high values of the electrical potential, which correspond to these two locations here. And in fact, this correspond to uh, locations where we have very high exchanges between the matrix and the fractures, and the fracture. And this is important because um, usually uh, high electrical potentials in terms of the spontaneous potential is related to high free flow. Uh, and we see here that uh, even if this in, in this long fracture we have free flow, we don't see high values of the electrical potential. So really we observe that these high values are related to uh, free flow exchanges between structures that have uh, very different uh, properties. Um, okay, and then uh, we work on more uh, realistic systems with uh, power low distributed lens with different, uh, different density. And uh, we observe again that uh, when we have an area with a high exchange from the matrix to the fracture, because this fracture is contributing to the pumping uh, thanks to the exchange uh, with the matrix, we will have a high value of the electrical potential. Well, here, uh, because we have something very dense, we don't observe any differences uh, around the circle where we do um, our measurements. Um, so that's uh, what we uh, observed uh, for, this, uh, for this application. And um, now we'll go uh, for uh, 2.5D uh, models because we want now to work on this ERT experiment that I mentioned before. And here we cannot use uh, 2D models because um, uh, in this application, we work with point source injection uh, for each electrode. So if we use 2D models, then we will have a line source injection and the physics of the problem will be uh, wrong. Um, but still, we don't want to go to 3D because we think it's very complicated and, and it will be hard to include that in an inversion strategy. So we do something between, which is the, uh, where we consider 2.5D models. So the structures in this case are still 2D meaning that, um, for example, the fractures will have, will have an infinite extent in one direction, uh, usually in the direction perpendicular to the measurement. But um, the uh, injection will be really point source injection. Uh, so the physics of the problem uh, will be right. And uh, that's uh, what uh, is called 2.5D. So for that, we start with a 3D equation. Um, that's the same as we saw before, except that now we have a point source injection and we have three directions in space, X and X, Y, Z for this problem. And we do the Fourier transform of this equation. So now we have two directions in space, X and Z, and we have uh, the Fourier variable, uh, omega, which is a wave number. 
uh, in the uh, final equation. And we're going to adapt our DDP formulation to uh, this expression in the Fourier domain. Again, uh, we have an analytical solution at the fracture scale that we use at the fracture network scale to enforce flow conservation. We have also a, um, a finite volume approach uh, that we have now in the Fourier domain. And as before, we have this exchange term that is now expressed again in the Fourier domain. And once we have this, we uh, look at our problem with injection and extraction that we can first um, divide into two problems, right? It's first a problem of injection and then a problem of extraction. And then for each of these problems, we're going to solve many 2D problems uh, for different values of the wave number. And uh, once we have solved all these 2D problems, uh, we can reconstruct uh, everything. Uh, so this 2D problem being in the Fourier domain, right? And then we can reconstruct everything and get the value of the electrical potential in the 3D uh, domain. So this is very interesting because all these steps uh, can be parallelized. So in terms of uh, computational cost, it's, it's exactly uh, what we need uh, for, um, for our problems. So from this, uh, we look at uh, different fracture networks for some numerical experiments. So we look at these three networks and uh, we use here the Wiener-Schönberger configuration with different electrode spacing. And we look at the uh, relative apparent resistivity uh, that is given by these experiments. And here uh, we report that is what is really investigated by the uh, electric um, current. So for example, when we start with this first uh, spacing between the electrode, we obtain uh, this value of the apparent resistivity for this system, which is the apparent resistivity of the matrix. So it means that in this case, the electrodes are so close that the uh, current is uh, just going um, um, just a little bit above uh, the surface and we don't reach this first fracture. So we don't see the fracture. And then when we go from uh, top to bottom, we increase the spacing between the electrodes. So the electric current go deeper and deeper into the system and we are going to see more and more fractures. And we have an increase, a decrease of the, uh, of the um, electrical resistivity. So then when we look at a um, more complicated system, we, we see again that we investigate uh, progressively uh, the fractures, but then we see that the curves are quite complicated uh, to, uh, to, to understand, even if we have just a, a few fractures uh, in these uh, studies. So uh, then to, um, to understand these different uh, shapes of the curve, we work on a very simple, uh, very simple uh, problem where we have only one fracture. We look just at two different fracture lengths and we look at different angle uh, of the fracture and the two different electrode configurations uh, that we uh, mentioned uh, before. And uh, we see, for example, that uh, so here that for the first lens and here for the second lens, um, and here Wiener Schubenger and dipole dipole, and from top to bottom, we increase the spacing between the electrodes. And if we look, for example, at the uh, case for the angle 10 degrees, uh, we see that the shape of the curve is uh, really changing when we increase um, the spacing between the electrodes. And then we'll get something even more uh, complicated and different when we look at dipole dipole configuration or when we have uh, the uh, largest uh, fracture lens. So uh, to uh, understand better this, we, we can just pick a few examples examples and look at the corresponding uh, video of the experiment uh, where uh, here we have in red the two uh, current electrodes and with the black circle we have the measurement uh, electrodes uh, 
uh, the fracture is uh, located here. Here is a 10 degree angle, and uh, this one will be the 80 degree, almost vertical. Um, and at the top, we have the Wiener Schumerge and then dipole dipole. And here we look at the relative apparent uh, resistivity, while here we will look at the difference in potential between the uh, current electrode. Um, just in the second case, we have a reverse behavior between uh, electrical resistivity and potential, because in this case, um, the um, geometrical factor is negative. Well, it, it's a detail, but it's easier to understand. Okay, so if we look at this first experiment and we look at the red curve here, which is uh, related to this curve here, uh, we see that um, at the beginning of the experiment, where the electrodes are far from the uh, fracture, uh, we have no changes and uh, we have uh, zero difference of potential. And um, sorry, here we look at the difference in potential when there is a fracture and when there is no fracture. Okay, And this is the distribution of uh, electrical potential. And then when we uh, keep moving uh, the electrodes, we see that when they are getting closer to the fracture, uh, the difference in the potential is going to uh, decrease because we have the impact of this fracture where an important part of the electric current uh, will go uh, through. And then when we get uh, farther away from the uh, fracture, uh, we increase this value and go back to a, a value equal uh, to zero. Okay, then when the fracture is almost vertical, we start, have, we have the same behavior at the beginning. Uh, this difference in potential decrease. Um, but then uh, we have this increase that is explained uh, by the fact that uh, at this position, the fracture is at the middle of the electrode array. And as the fracture is almost vertical, uh, it does not impact the electric current propagation because the current just goes through the fracture aperture, which explains the difference uh, between uh, these two curves. And then we observe again the, the behavior that we saw before. And then, and I'm almost done, um, when we look below at dipole-dipole uh, configuration, we see the impact of having the current electrode on one side and the measurement electrode on the other side. So here we see the impact of the fracture when the measurement electrode start being above the fracture. And then this decrease when the ele measurement electrodes go away from the fracture. Oops, sorry, uh, we are back here. Okay, and then we start having an impact again where now it's the measurement electrode that are above uh, the fractures, the fracture, right? And then this decrease when we uh, go away from the fracture. And just in this case, we don't have exactly the same behavior because uh, having this fracture almost vertical uh, is going to uh, reduce uh, the uh, extent of the influence of the fracture. So we don't see this part where uh, the influence of the fracture is less. Uh, important. So all this is just showing that uh, it's quite complicated to interpret these curves and that we, we really might want uh, um, as many data as we can uh, to uh, be able to invert uh, all these things and get information about um, the fractures and the subsurface. So now if we talk about uh, inversion very quickly and we look at this very simple example of a vertical fracture with again two configurations of the electrodes, we'll get this kind of um, uh, data from the forward model where here we move the electrode and when we go down, we increase the uh, uh, electrode spacing. And if we do a standard inversion with, with uh, a software that is um, develop for equivalent purpose domain and it's really not adapted for that we obtain this kind of uh, uh, results uh, because the software is just trying to uh, minimize the objective portion function for each mesh so we don't have really something that uh, makes sense so from this 
we clearly see that we should go for stochastic inversion, uh, what we're starting to do uh, with our DDP approach combined with the uh, DREAM uh, software. And again, with this uh, simple vertical uh, fracture example, we'll have this uh, kind of data from the 4-1 model. And here we do the inversion with 12 chains for this case when we invert for the position of the fracture. And we see that the chains converge uh, quickly, about, uh, we need about 50 uh, iterations. And we see that the probability density of the position is uh, well located uh, at the uh, true position of the fracture. And from this, well, we just think that we might don't we might not want to invert on the position because then when we have many fractures that we imply many parameters. So we we go for um, something like a grid like this, where we will invert for segments, and where each segment will be a matrix or a fracture part. And we starting to do some tests on uh, this simple case where we divide the fracture into segments and we invert the property of each segment. We have, again, this data for the 4-1 model. And here we see the misfit for each uh, chain in our uh, stochastic inversion. And here we have this final result, a final result which, is, uh, which is nice and is good, but uh, that is for one uh, fracture. So then the next step is to apply this to more complicated fracture networks. Well, of course, the results will be simplified because we work on grid, but um, at least we think that we'll be able to, to handle uh, the uh, corresponding number of uh, parameters. Uh, and that's it. Thanks uh, for your attention. So thank so, you very much, uh, <laughs> Delphine, for this very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I saw that there are many questions already. So Sebastian, okay. uh, please go ahead. So I'd, should I stop the screen yes, sharing? Um, yes. Yeah, because okay. then you can see us okay. as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Delphine, also from, from me for a really interesting talk and things that are um, very close to my heart, but then yet so far, because you talk about the streaming potential and I've only <laughs> thought about fluid flow. So I start with one from Florian Doster, who um, was actually last week's speaker, and he says, um, nice talks, talk so far, Delphine. Do I understand correctly that you've generalized the EDFM, HFM method to electric currents? Um, Sebastian, please explain EDFM, HFM if needed. So embedded discrete fracture method, or hybrid fracture method. So what do, what do you, uh, what do you think about exactly about EDFM? So, mm -hmm. so the numerical technique that you have lower dimensional fractures uh, yes. in 1D lines in 2D um, domains. So it looks through and wonders, it looks from your talk, you have been able to generalize those numerical techniques to model electric currents in fractured reservoirs. Is that correct? Yes, but I'm, I'm just not sure what's EDFM. Embedded, so that's the embedded discrete fracture embedded method. Discrete so, fracture so it's the, the idea that you have one dimensional yes. lines in so know, it's it's two dimensional all, matrix. Okay, yeah, so it's almost the same, except that, um, from what I know, in uh, in this kind of method, um, uh, they work with um, um, so that won't be electrical potential, but hydraulic head that are average uh, at the matrix block size. Uh, and uh, for us, we wanted something more precise than that. And that's why, that's why we use an analytical solution at the fracture scale. So it means that when we are in one matrix block and we have the fracture inside, we won't consider just an average value of the hydraulic head uh, for the fracture. We really have the changes of the hydraulic head along the fracture. Uh, so that will be the most important difference uh, with this method. But otherwise, the concept is the same. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Julian Mace has a question. He wonders, can you extend this work to multi-phase flow? What needs to be done if you have two fluids present in the subsurface? I'm not an expert in this part, so I would say yes from a first guess. and. Um, I don't see why it won't be applicable to multi-phase flow. So I would say it's possible, but it's 
probably necessary to check. Okay. And so along other applications, um, Ali al Rudani wonders, and so is it possible to adopt the same methodology to see the interactions between cold and hot water during geothermal applications in fractured reservoirs? Because you have the analogy between heat potential and electric potential as well, so Fourier's law, Ohm's law, and Darcy's law. Uh, yeah, but for um, for heat, you will have more complicated equations huh? because you have advection and, and uh, diffusion. So in this case, we I personally I use some particle tracking method because I think it's more adapted um, okay. for heat transfer. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, and just sorry, just to complete. Sorry. I mean, this works well because we have a Poisson equation, yeah. um, which is easier to handle that uh, ED equation. So I, I, yeah, I, I want to that it will work well for heat. To be honest. So I'm just seeing that there's a lot of chat between. Um, the audience, was, um, Florian just comments and said, with respect to Julian's comment, I would guess the time scales are separate enough that you can freeze the fluid configuration. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Um, Christine Meyer wonders and um, says, thank you for your talk. Um, would different mineralogy of the rock affect the electric response to the interactions with injected water? So, how much do we know to know about? The lithology, not to, to interpret the signals. Um, well, I, I have to admit I'm on the numerical side, so um, I'm not a big expert in that. But yes, the mineralogy will will, will change the uh, electrical conductivity of the of the sample or the system. So um, yes, that will have an impact for for sure. Yeah. And. There's more questions from Julian Florian, who was a really busy, really interesting your talk. Um, and they asked a quite similar question. So I'm going to put both to them, uh, both of the questions to you. Um, so Florian wonders you know, how far can these methods in vertical commerce see into the rock so spatially? And Julian has a similar question say, does the streaming potential tell us anything about the underlying structure of the matrix, so for example, pore size distribution. So what's the temporal, ext uh, the spatial extent that we can see into the rock matrix or into the rock away from the well? And what is so the minimum resolution, or the maximum resolution that we can get from um, electrical measurements? Well, yeah, I, I think these measurements are, are very interesting because we, we can really work on a very large extent. Uh, when we have this long cable, it, it's really meters uh, on which we can get the data. So uh, that's a, a very interesting part uh, um, uh, for me. Uh, then uh, how small you can go, uh, that's a good question because you, as we saw at the beginning, we can um, do um, experiment in the boreholes. Um, for spontaneous potential, I, I think it's 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 quite a complicated thing to to handle, um, especially because spontaneous potential is uh, related to many processes. So here I talk just about free flow, um, just to simplify things. But in reality, in the field, what you observe can be uh, related to the presence of uh, bacteria, to different mineralogy, to, to the chemical composition of the water. So this this part is hard to, to handle, I would say. Um, but for ERT and large extent, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's very good in this sense. And the difficulty is to, um, is to deal with the inversion part, uh, in fact. OK. Um... Yeah, thank you very much. And I do have a few questions along those lines myself, but I'm going to have another question from Julian. Um, he says, are there any applications to other processes like electrolyzers and fuel cells where you have chemical potentials changing that you could measure? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know when enough about these applications. Okay. I will. I'd be happy to talk about it, 
um, <laughs> with someone who knows more about the applications and, and I could talk about the numerical part, but uh, right now I, I don't know. So let me, there are no questions from the audience at the moment. Um, so two questions that came that, that I've been wondering during your talk. First one is how routinely are electrical measurements used? Is that something that so the energy industry is using very routinely or the groundwater industry? Or is it m still more on a research side that it has a lot of potential, but it's not, um, not used on a, on a regular basis yet? I've seen some of the, sorry, I'm rambling on here a little bit, but I've seen some of the older work from André Ville where they've mapped um, um, hydrothermal flow at um, Stromboli volcano, I think it was, using electrical resistivity yeah. measurement. So how how regularly is that used as a tool? So it's it's um, it's maybe not very often as a tool because it's hard then to interpret the results. Uh, but the, the thing is that it's very easy to 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 do, right? It's it's um, and it's not very expensive uh, device uh, to acquire and it's uh, easy to use. So you can easily get a lot of data. Um, one of the disadvantage is that you uh, don't go very far into the subsurface. So that mm -hmm. was people will prefer seismic or, or radar stuff. Um, but the possibility to do these measurements in boreholes uh, is also interesting and uh, can solve uh, this um, uh, problem about uh, going deep into the subsurface. But I th I think it's really, uh, it could be used um, uh, more routinely if we had better tools uh, to interpret the data. Because very often you end up with a bunch of data and we use this standard uh, software to invert, but then when you have strong heterogeneity, it does not really make sense anymore. So you have to add some geological interpretation. So. I, I really believe it's a matter of having better inversion tools. And that's the okay. research part, yeah. So that's a nice segue into the question I wanted to ask, but Florin actually has, has beaten me to it. So I'm giving um, that, uh, the question to Florin. I said, you only touched upon inversion at the end. Can you comment on how noisy the signal is? I.e., Can you identify features of fractures and what do you actually, um, in the forward modeling and, and what kind of features can you identify of the fracture? So was the signal yeah. still too noisy that um, it's, as we said, too difficult to get certain parameters out? So we, we looked at this kind of thing in the this is a study where we have just one fracture, uh, where we have something very simple, uh, where we see that to, to really see above the noise, um, the theoretical noise, uh, you you need a high contrast between the fracture and matrix um, properties, uh, but which is still realistic. But uh, it's true that we, we you won't be able to identify uh, fractures with very small apertures. Um, I I don't remember the ratio. I think the ratio was three or four orders of magnitude between these uh, properties. So implying that we will identify uh, really uh, highly conductive uh, structures. Mm. Um, and uh, yes, you can identify one like we saw, but uh, again, to be able to identify more things then it's a matter of uh, inversion. But in any case, we will uh, identify only the main uh, big path, that's for sure. Mm. Thank you. Um, and just so for my clarification, so you always do the measurements on the land surface. You couldn't do anything, so downhole and deploy the cables. Yes, you could. The... Yeah. So it's it's not done uh, uh, very often, but uh, you have some studies where they do it in tunnels, so you mm -hmm. can have uh, uh, some electrodes at the surface and then some electrodes in the tunnel. Uh, but we could also in boreholes, uh, but it, um, there are just very, very few studies um, on that. Mm. So Florian just said, um, thank you very much. I will definitely have a closer look at your papers. Um, you. We have a question from Yuang Wang, um, quite a detailed question. He says, um, thank you very much for your presentation. A minor question. Have you mentioned how your 
EDFMU simulation framework differs from the ones the reservoir simulation community, um, Lietol and um, Hadi, Hadi, Hadi's um, approach, continues specifically the projection based EDFM methods, which parallel and parallel embedded fractures can be consistently considered. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of those papers. Yes. Um, so I know where Lee, Lee et al. because uh, I uh, started from that uh, when I was working for method with electric current. And um, so I did implement what I, I thought was equivalent to Lee et al. And it, it was working OK, but it was not precise enough uh, for uh, what we needed meaning that um, to uh, validate the method, then we needed um, uh, very small matrix blocks. Again, because uh, like I explained uh, at the beginning, uh, in this method, you average uh, the n no at the matrix block scale. And we really wanted to be able to have large uh, matrix blocks. So that's, how, that's how we end up with this analytical solution uh, at the fracture scale. Uh, so, but then we didn't really do uh, um, uh, um, a really sophisticated benchmarks uh, that was just comparison, a uh, quick comparison, and, and we end up with these things that we need something more precise um, than this method. But we started from this method, yeah. Mm. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, I don't see any new questions coming through from the audience and we're also reaching the full hour quite rapidly so thank you very much again Delphine for your talk for taking the time to thank present you. to us to um, answer all the questions thank you to our audience for the many interesting questions and great interactions and Martia over to you for some final yes. comments so thank you very much, uh, Delphine. It was really interesting. So I would like to take the chance now to introduce our next week's speaker. Uh, so next week we will host Matteo Lupi from the University of Geneva, who will speak about heat, fluids and seismicity in Western Switzerland, an integrated approach to pinpoint geothermal resources. So until next week, and as Hadi says, uh, stay happy, healthy and tuned in to our geoscience and geoenergy channel. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.